Todd White, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Happy to be here and good to see you after all of this COVID nonsense. And we haven't been to many events, so I haven't seen you in a couple of years. It's great to see you. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen you, and I was just telling you offline how uh, our group loves you. When I, you know, when I say our group, I mean Dr. Pompa, Dr. Mindy Pals, and the doctors that I work with. They're, you're always at their events. It's always your wine, and it's like the go-to. And we're gonna we're gonna talk all about wine and alcohol, and uh, we're gonna give the audience just a masterclass on how to choose the right wine and the right alcohol. We're also gonna get into some uh, uh, things like fasting. You just mentioned you're on a four day, you're on day four of a five day water fast. Mm -hmm. I wanna hear about that. We'll talk about OMAD. But before we get there, I'm getting ahead of myself. How did you even get invo involved with being the wine expert? I know that you stumbled upon it by accident. So let's go back and talk about your backstory. Yeah, it was kind of an accident. So I would, so about seven years ago, I started experimenting long before keto came to the mainstream. but. I was following the biohacking community, as were you, and Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, who I know is a friend of yours and a friend of mine, and also, a, you know, a, endorses our wines because of their um, lack of effect on ketosis. But Dominic was starting to publish work in uh, really work he was doing for DARPA, for the Defense Department, and it was bleeding over into the biohacking circles. This is a few years before it started getting into Google searches. And at the time I was really interested in, became interested in ketosis because I had experimented with it in the 1980s with the Atkins diet. And you know, Bob Atkins was ridiculed deeply throughout most of the health world or medical world about his work in his book, but it turns out that he was correct. And he died a tragic death before it was really validated that what the work he had published had really helped millions of people. He knew anecdotally that it had, but you know the science hadn't come forward because most of the science we had up until that time in the 1980s was really on drug-resistant epilepsy treatment. But when Dominic started publishing his work, and there were others, but Dominic became the most kind of predominant because he's Dominic and he's charming and he's handsome and he's done a bunch of podcasts and you know he'd started to leak his papers out into the biohacking community. So I, for about two years, uh, experimented with a therapeutic ketogenic diet. I mean, really hardcore. You know, daily BHB testing via blood. I mean, competing with my friends on how how high my ketone count. You remember those days? Yeah. And when it was like eight dollars a strip. If you right, 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 yeah. right. And so. And, and it was, and I started experimenting with it, but then, you know, really got serious when I started doing blood testing with Abbott and which was recommended by Dominic, if you were going to be serious before that, we're using urine sticks, which you know, are unreliable after a period of time. They're okay to start experimenting with keto, but if you really want to go hardcore, you're going to go blood. Yep. And <clears throat> so. I was therapeutically ketogenic for a couple of years, and the reason I continued to experiment with it was that the cognitive benefits were so extraordinary, just the same way I'm feeling right now on day four. I haven't checked my ketones because I know my body and I've been testing for years, and but I'm deep into ketosis right now to be sure. I can feel it on the top of my brain. And and so, you know, I, I experimented with it both for achieving super lean body mass and also the cognitive benefits improvement in memory and but after a couple of years in fairness I guess for about five years now I would be what I would consider to be a modified ketogenic diet or more like the Atkins diet I'm not therapeutic anymore I do get into therapeutic ketosis when I do extended water fast but other than that my BHP is probably like you know 0.8 to 1.2 millimolar most of the time. It's fair to note that even though I'm on an extended water fast now, I also only eat once a day. And I've yeah. been eating only one meal a day for about five and a half years. And we can get into fasting and why I think it's so important and why I think it's the single most, the single most advancement in my wellness of all the practices that I have. I mean, wow. there there are many, many health and wellness practices that I do daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, many. But I think the most significant 
forward leap advancing at my age, and I'm 61. And so the most forward leaping advantage at my age was to adapt a very um, uh, aggressive fasting regimen. But when I was th therapeutically ketogenic, for whatever reason, um, I began to have an adverse relationship with wine and alcohol in general. I didn't. I haven't drank spirits. I've only been a wine drinker for about 30 years now. I've been drinking wine since I was nine years old, and I've been a lifelong wine aficionado. Wow. So I started to have this adverse relationship with it about the same time. Now, there could have been many other cofactors, but about the same time that, you know, that I was practicing this ketogenic diet or therapeutic keto. And so I stopped drinking for a while and I really love that because I love wine and we'll talk about wine and the terrible dangers of alcohol in a moment but so I when I went back to drinking wine I started diluting it with uh, water and tea and other ways to reduce the alcohol I, I now it's a common side effect for many people who become ketogenic that their relationship with alcohol also changes and I don't mm -hmm. know if those were tied together or if it was just a cofactor of my aging or I was under stress with a business at the time who knows I mean alcohol and your relationship with alcohol is impacted by a number of cofactors sugar is a big impact uh, stress is a big impact about how alcohol how you interpret alcohol and how it interprets you right and so there are many cofactors of that diet among them, physical fitness. There, there are many, you know, there are many cofactors. So it's hard, you know, it's hard to nail down one thing. But I wasn't feeling well. I wasn't enjoying drinking, and so I went to this friend of mine who I lived in the Napa Valley at the time, and I went to this friend who I thought knew the most about wine of anybody I knew, and I asked him because I thought it was purely alcohol. This is before I knew about all the other toxins in wine that we're going to talk about. Because nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about the toxins in wine. Still, most people don't know about the toxins right. in wine. And so I went to this friend and I was like, listen, I'm having this struggle with alcohol, wine, and, you know, the way it makes me feel and the way it impacts my brain. And, and, but I don't want to stop drinking. And he's like, I think I, I was like, how I was thinking about making some low alcohol wine at the time. So I said, how low can I make alcohol and wine still have it taste like wine? Because see, once you remove, when you remove enough alcohol from wine, it doesn't taste like wine anymore. Alcohol adds density to wine, and we can talk more about that later. But so I, he said, have you have you ever tried these low alcohol wines? that are made in Europe. And I was like, he's like, they're kind of old school and they're just lower in alcohol. I was like, no. So that set me on the journey. And I wasn't thinking, Dry Farm Wines wasn't a business idea. I wasn't trying to create a business all at the time. I was unemployed. And um, so I started searching for low alcohol wines and all the ones I was tasting, I couldn't drink them, pour them down the sink, right? They were just terrible tasting. And so, but I stumbled quite accidentally through a friend of a friend onto an organic market in San Francisco. This is a little longer story than you'd hope for probably, but I go into this organic market. I buy some of these low alcohol wines and there's this one particular importer named Paris Wine Company that I love their wines, right? Their wines were like amazing and low alcohol. Well, Paris Wine Company was founded by this American who was living in Paris, and he, by chance, used to live in San Francisco and work in this organic market that is very famous called Buy Right Market. Probably one of, I mean, there are two favorite organic food stores I have in the United States. One is in San Francisco called Buy Right, and the other is in Los Angeles called Air One. Have you ever been to Air One? No, I've heard great things about it. I mean, it's just places. amazing. It's like yeah. walking into a painting. I mean, it's like oh. unbelievable. Wow. And the same thing, Buy Right and Air One are very different, but they're like world-class organic markets. Wow. Uh, particularly Buy Right, which Buy Right sources most of their, um, they curate and source most everything from local Bay Area farmers, but curated 
along with super amazing international selections. Uh, it's just it's just how it's curated is amazing. So, and it's not big as a minute. The whole thing's like tiny. So I went and I get these wines. I taste them. I'm like, oh my gosh, this wine is great. It's low alcohol. I feel better drinking it. I like the whole thing is like working out amazing for me. And so I call this American in Paris and I'm like, what's up with these wines? Because they taste great and they make me feel great. And he's like, oh, they're natural wines. I was like, what's a natural wine? Same thing I, I tell people. They're, what do you do? I say, I sell natural wine. They're like, isn't all wine natural? I'm like, no, it's not for the reasons we're going to discuss. Yeah. So from there, I was like, because I lived in Napa Valley and I had made wine about 10 years before as a hobby, I knew a little bit about analogy. And so I, I decided I'm going to start lab testing these wines because I was ketogenic and I want to make sure they were sugar-free. And I wanted to lab test for a number of things, but the primary thing I was looking for was alcohol and sugar. And because we'll get into this in a moment when we talk about the conspiracy between the wine industry and the government, the alcohol stated on the wine bottle, by law, is not required to be accurate. Hmm. Now, let me stop there for a moment on alcohol because that's kind of... That's kind of yep. that pathway accidentally led me into founding Dry Farm Wines. When I started sharing these wines with my friends, and they're like, well, where do we get these wines? And I'm like, you can't because, you know, I've gone through this process to select them. And so then it kind of became a business. And I figured I was looking for a job at the time. I figured that or looking for a gig. I'm not employable. I've been self-employed since I was 17, so I'm not employable, but I was between gigs. And I was looking for a new gig, and I was like, you know, I think there's probably a few million other people who care about this too because I care about it, and I'm sure the other people who care about it. And so that started the journey, which took off pretty quick and, as you know, became very popular. But speaking of alcohol, because I know you don't drink, Correct. Yeah. For the audience, you know, uh, some might not know, but I, I don't drink personally. I haven't had any alcohol in over six years. My fiance drinks. She don't, she drinks dry farm wines. Dry farm wines is like my go-to recommendation. You'll understand why as you get through this episode, but yeah, I don't drink. Let's continue on the, do the discussion on alcohol. So it surprises most people. And I write and speak about this often. It surprises most people to hear me say the following. Because they think I'm here to sell wine, mm -hmm. which I'm not. I think if you drink wine, you should drink low-alcohol, sugar-free, natural wines. I don't care whether you get them from me or not. I'm here to educate people that if you are going to drink, here's how I would think about drinking as a drinking professional who also cares about biohacking, health, fasting, cold thermogenesis, keto. If you care about the things I care about, I've done a lot of research on this, and I can help you. Whether you buy it from me or not, that's up to you. But what really surprises people to hear me say is that alcohol is a very dangerous neurotoxin that ruins millions of lives a year. And many people shouldn't drink at all. And if you don't drink today, I'm not recommending that you begin. Further, my life might be improved if I didn't drink at all. It's very possible because I drink a lot of wine and I like wine. If I didn't drink at all, I didn't get I, that. I'm, Could you try again? Well, there was Siri. No, <laughs> Siri's that's all right. like, what do you mean you're si not, you don't drink? Yeah, exactly. Drink. Siri was <laughs> checking up on me on my drinking habits. <laughs> you got Siri freaking out there. Exactly. So, <laughs> anyway, I you know I think it's quite possible that I could take another step up. Now, I'm, you, as you can see from my face, I don't suffer from a lot of inflammation. I mean, but you look, maybe you look healthy I, to me, you're 60, you said 61. You don't look 61. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's all this keto and biohacking. It yeah. works. Yep. So I've also been doing it for a really, really long time. Although, as you know, keto research shows that anytime you start, no matter what your age, you're going to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, and there's great, uh, there's, there's great data out there on research to, to show that, but, but the, um, but here's the thing. I'm not going to stop drinking wine because I like it. 
and most other people who like it and drink regularly, I, when except when I'm on an extended water fast, I'll drink a bottle or more per night. I don't wow. drink during the daytime. And when I say a bottle or more, that's over the course of the evening, right? It's not like I'm sitting down and hammering a bottle down. It's like with a meal or a meal with other people or, you know, in a communal setting. And, and, it's, and it's your wine. which it, I only drink exclusively our wine. Correct. And, and if I drink a bottle of conventional wine, I would story. become sick. Yeah. And it would be impossible. Yeah. Same thing that was happening to me before for a whole bunch of reasons we're about to discuss. Yep. So even though I believe it's possible that, that my health journey could be enhanced if I stopped drinking altogether, I think that's a, I think it's a fair possibility. Uh, but the reason I mentioned inflammation is that excess drinking can cause inflammation, which clearly I don't suffer from. Now, even though I drink a bottle of wine a day, sometimes more, sometimes a little less, usually a little more, is that, is, is that I only drink a very specific type of wine, right? Natural wine, low alcohol, sugar-free, lab-tested by us. And I drink wines typically between 10 and 11% alcohol. And conventional wines are generally 14.5 or 15% alcohol. That doesn't sound like a big difference, but it's a huge difference in how you feel and your brain health, your inflammation, and then all the other things and toxins that are in wine that cause also inflammation, cause you to feel bad, uh, histamine reactions, uh, tyramine reactions. We'll, we'll get into this further. But so it's important to understand how we got here and how wine, which was thought to be the healthy drink, how wine became unhealthy. And it really comes down to two things. It's about money and greed. And so what happened about 30 or 40 years ago is that using public money from Wall Street, some smart business guys consolidate and roll up the wine business. And there's a couple of reasons for why that happened. Primarily, this is all very confusing and complicated, but the way wine gets into a retail store is also a conspiracy with the government. So the way alcohol gets into your state, depending upon what state you live in, but most states, in some states, the, the, the actual state itself controls which wine come in. Wow. In the rest of the states, they come in through what's called the three-tier system, which is a distributor who's appointed by the state and has typically been a multi-generational distributor. Families are very wealthy, have a lot of political power. Those distributors exclusively decide which wines come into that state. This is called the three-tier system. It's been in place since the 1940s. And the reason it was put in place was to prohibit organized crime from controlling the alcohol industry. Hmm. But today, that's no longer a risk. It was at that time. And the three-tier and what they call Tide House rules, all these are all federal laws that are decades outdated, but at the end of the day, they control exactly which wines come to your store because that's the only way you can legally get wine into retail. Now, the problem with that and how the consolidation I mentioned happened is <clears throat> you have these giant wine companies. Now, they don't want you to know about them, but they're giant wine companies. In fact, the top three make over 52% of wines in the United States. Wow. The top 30 make over 70% of wines in the United States. Now, Crazy. why is that important? Because these multi-billion dollar marketing conglomerates, they're not trying to make wine healthier or better. They're trying to make it cheaper and faster. Now, how does that relate to the three-tier system I just told you about, about the distributors deciding which wine gets into your store? Well, it works like this. The distributors, they do business with these giant wine companies, right? Because it's easier and more profitable for them because they're dealing with these huge companies. The guy who makes natural wine in France, he has no chance of getting on the shelf, right? Because he doesn't make enough volume. Nobody knows who his brand is. 
right? Because wine is sold three ways. L rating, label, animals on the label, cute farmhouses, and pedigree, which is advertising dollars, mm -hmm. right? So I know the brand. That's how Americans buy wine. Well, if it's some obscure natural winemaker who, A, makes very little volume, because you can't make wine and natural wine in high volume, and we'll talk about that in a moment and why. Sorry to take you down this wormhole, no, but... No, no please. I, it's so I, interesting. It's the I, first time we covered it, so I'm please go. Tr so deep. Trying to tell you why you can't buy healthy, better wine at yeah. the store. Right? It's important. This is, all, this is a lot of new information to me, so I'm learning as yeah. well. So, so, please keep going. so this whole system, like much of American food distribution, is all controlled by a handful of people. Right then, who then sell to a handful of people, the grocers, right? And so, consolidation matters because buying power and profit and margins matter because that's mm -hmm. all that matters. Yeah. And so these multi-billion-dollar, huge marketing wine conglomerates and manufacturers who make wine in factories in Central California—that's most of the wine that you see when you go in, into your store. So it. You can see hundreds or even thousands of brands and labels, but those are all made by the same people. Not all of them, but the propensity of it is made by the yeah. same people. So that gets us to the next problem about how they want to make it cheaper and faster, not healthier and better. So two things follow that. First of all, industrial farming practices and the use of industrial chemicals like glyphosate. The second thing on the farming is the widespread use of irrigation, which also has a whole bunch of problems associated with this. You know, the name of our company is Dry Farm Wines, which means we do not allow for grapevines to be irrigated. And if we have time, we'll get into why. But since we have so many higher level points to cover, if we get time to get back to irrigation, we'll get to that. But irrigation is riddled with problems, aside from the fact that it wastes a lot of water. Right? I mean, we're in a drought internationally, and even just the farms that we work with, the small family farms, about 800 of them that we work with to source these rare, pure natural wines, we save over a billion gallons of water a year by, by, by not irrigating. Wow. And so irrigation is unnecessary we're not going to go down the irrigation wormhole, but irrigation is not necessary to grow a grapevine anywhere on this planet. And irrigation didn't come to the United States for grape farming until the early 1970s. Now it's is it because near, it grows faster with irrigation and the, they could pump more out? Is that why? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. It's easier to farm, way easier. It, it grows a bigger cluster which results in a higher yield. And it might not surprise you when you fill a grape berry with water by, by over irrigating it, it weighs more. And see, fruit is sold by the ton. More it weighs, more it's worth. So not only is it easier and cheaper, but it's worth more. Yeah. So these, the, and then the third problem in addition to farming and irrigation, the third and perhaps most poignant problem is that there are 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. Now, why don't you know about those additives unless you've heard me talk about them? And they've been occasionally in recent years mentioned in the mainstream press, but not too much, you see, because in the food and wine magazines where you might expect to see coverage on natural wine or guess who some of their biggest advertisers are, right? They're conventional wine companies. Mm -hmm. So they don't want a lot of coverage on this, although it has been mentioned a few times in food and wine magazines. It's been mentioned in the New York Times. Um, in fact, Eric Asimov, who's the wine critic for the New York Times, just this past weekend did an article on natural wines hmm. that must have pissed off a lot of those well people. he didn't go hard on the additives i mean nobody okay. wants to because all of these people are big advertisers so okay nobody's going the only person going hard on all this is me 
Mm-hmm. And um, I can assure you, it makes it makes me no fan of the wine industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I've been attacked by them, of course. How so? I mean, when you say that, like uh, lawsuits, press articles. No, okay. I'm not telling. I'm not saying anything that's untrue. Yeah. So they yeah. don't have any liable claim against me. What I'm saying is the truth. Articles, but there have been stop. some negative press articles, not many, just a couple in the wine industry. You know where. Mm-hmm. You know, I've agreed to be interviewed, and then it turns out to be a hit piece, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's all right. No, no big deal. All press is good press for me. I, you know, yeah. the wine industry can, you know, I don't give a shit about them. Yeah. So you have the pesticides and herbicides, issue number one. Irrigation, issue number two. 76 additives. 76. And I remember when I interviewed Dr. Zach Bush a couple of years ago, um, and you could maybe correct or confirm. He said the average California wine has about 64 herbicides and pesticides in it. It's uh, it's true. I don't know the exact number. We don't sell domestic wine because no, right. there are no domestic wines that meet our standards of purity. So we don't sell domestic wine. And I'm not an expert on California wine. So I that's what Dr. Bush, Bush said. And, he, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I, he's I, a knowledgeable I, guy. He's it's an, an alarming I'll, statement, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll go along with him. He knows a lot about <laughs> glyphosate as well, which, you know, glyphosate is, Roundup is the number one applied herbicide in domestic vineyards. Yeah, you want to create leaky gut, you know, drink wine with Roundup. That'll, that'll, <laughs> nice. yeah. Well, here's the problem with it all is a lack of transparency. So the reason you don't know about these 76 additives, and in fairness, three quarters of them are natural. So... But I don't want to mislead anybody or throw the baby under the bus. Okay. However, about a quarter of them are problematic. And they're not disclosed on the label. There is no label. This is, is the problem. Wine is the only major food group without a contents label. Now, that's not an accident. The reason it doesn't have a contents label or nutritional information on it, if you want to know how much sugar's in it, which is the first thing I look for in nutritional information is sugar. Mm -hmm. I think sugar is the most widely addictive and abused drug on the planet that has led to most of chronic illness. And so I don't want to drink sugar or eat it. Now, do I generally consume, do I, do I occasionally consume sugar? Sure. But daily day in and day out, I make a conscious effort not to consume it. And I certainly never drink it. And so if I do consume sugar, since I just berated the shit out of it, if I do eat sugar, it's through something really delicious and extraordinary, right? Like a French crepe or, you know, something that's really extraordinary. I never drink it. And I don't consume it in commercial ways. And on the rare occasion, 10 times a year, when I do interact with it, it's through something really extraordinary mm-hmm. from a taste perspective because I'm a, I'm a taste guy, I'm a taste master. But so the problem is that the wine industry has spent millions of dollars in lobby money over the years to keep contents labeling off of wine because they don't want you to know what's in it because there's some pretty scary stuff that can go in there like dimethyl dicarbonate which is the most toxic of all the offenders. What does that do? What does that do to the body? Well, if you go to Wikipedia and you search dimethyl dicarbonate, you look at the table on the right, it'll just say hazard colon toxic. Now, here's the problem. If you decide to drink dimethyl dicarbonate or sugar for that matter, that should be your choice. I'm not here to rule your body, but if you choose to know what you put in your body, you don't have that choice where wine is concerned. And so I'm not here to say that my way is the right way for everyone. I do think my way is the right way if you're interested in conscious alcohol consumption mm-hmm. and you're interested in what you put in your body. And if that's, you... that's pretty much most of the people who are watching and listening, right? And I think what you're doing really well is number one, bringing awareness to this whole situation. And then they can make that decision. If you want to be aligned with your healthy lifestyle patterns, then maybe it's not a good idea to continue drinking those store-bought wines or even at restaurants, the wines you find there too. Yeah, so back to alcohol for a second. As you know, in the biohacking community and the forward health-looking community and in the keto community, 
it's many health leaders recommend tequila as the alcohol of choice if you're going to drink. And I understand that. And I don't dispute the reason that they recommend it. It's a distilled spirit. It's definite, pure, and clean, and it comes from a plant. I can get on board with all of that. The problem with tequila is it's 45% alcohol. Got it. And and so the alcohol, among, among its many faults... Um, as you, we discussed, I'm not a pro. I'm not pro alcohol. I'm pro drinking smart wine, uh, but alcohol is not my friend or anybody else's. It has limited benefits in the right dosage in the right way. But alcohol is a domino drug, and what I mean by that is that the more you drink of it at the higher level of concentration, the more you are to drink more. So the more you drink, the more likely you are to drink more. And so therefore, I don't drink spirits or anything at that alcohol level because it's not good for my brain health. I don't care what it's made out of. What I do drink is pure, natural wine that, and let's talk about what makes a natural wine natural because it's yeah. super consuming term, uh, super confusing term. Yeah, and then what exactly like, does dry farming mean? Like, how do you do it without the irrigation? So explain the process. Well, irrigation is another thing we'll get back to, but let me tell you the three the three cornerstones of irrigation. We could do a half hour on. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a disaster for the plant, for the planet. It produces fruit that actually has lower polyphenols. The and mycotoxins as well, I imagine. Well, Mold? no, you know, we, we, we test for mycotoxins, but, but the fact of the matter is, you know, while we could, you know, there's certain people like in coffee who make a big deal out of mycotoxins. The fact of the matter is if you do lab testing across coffees and wine, you'll find the incidence of mycotoxins is so low it's not even mentionable. It's more of a it's more of a marketing interesting pitch. But pesticides and herbicides different story. Very With different coffee. story. Mycotoxins yeah. very different. Okay. And so uh, like ochratoxin A. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can talk about it and it makes some scary shit, right? But it's a it's my experience in lab testing and we do lab testing for it. My experience is it's I've never seen it. Right. I mean, it's, it's just like it's and I hear the same thing in coffee, although some people have made their business out of mold and coffee. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Although I'm told I'm not a coffee expert, but I'm told that that, too, is not usually prevalent or it's just interesting. Like, so, yeah. But I'm not. But, a the, coffee but, expert. For those, but for those who missed it, that doesn't mean you shouldn't buy organic coffee because you still what you still need to worry about. Well, the you can get coffee. mycotoxins. You can get mycotoxins in organic coffee. I mean, you can get yeah, different from well, herbicide. What, what I mean is a coffee bean that's testing for herbicides and pesticides. Agreed. So agreed. You sure definitely want to be drinking organic coffee. Yeah. I'm just, and again, I'm not a coffee expert. I can tell you in wines that ochratoxin A, which is the primary mycotoxin that you would be looking for, is almost never present okay interesting all right so how, dry farming i could sell it to use a scary threat of you should drink our wines because <laughs> I mean, they're it, mycotoxin it, it, free it, it but, sounds great it's a great but, but tour, we do right? test but for them i can tell you that I, so i've even you know used that you know mold free coffee right but sure. this is uh, well, mold free wine we sell mold free wine too <laughs> yeah you really do but, so talk about you know the, the process so the so here's here, so let's there are three hallmarks of natural wine and it's also fair to note, while Dry Farm Wines has a very stringent certification process for all of our wines, we personally have a certification process, the Dry Farm Wine Certification. Natural wine, there's no certification in the world for natural wine. Now, Dry Farm Wine Certification goes over and above just being natural. We'll come back to that in a moment. But, but there's no country in in the world yet that certifies a natural wine france in 2023 is going to certify natural wines 
Interesting. That being said, France has also said that they're going to introduce contents labeling on wine, which we're a huge proponent of. I don't think it'll ever happen in the United States because wow. political power is too strong. Mm-hmm. But um, so number one, natural wines. But even though it's not a certification, let me just stop there. There is an international understanding from everybody in the wine business what natural wine means. And there are these three components. Okay. Number one, natural wine is always organic or biodynamically grown. Always. Let me stop there for a second because this is another confusing thing. Not all organic wines are natural. But all natural wines are always organic. Okay. So if you go into your store and you see an organic wine, that doesn't mean it's natural mm-hmm. because of the next two components. It does and mean it's it? organic, and I think you should drink organic wine is better than drinking non-organic wine. But it doesn't mean it's natural. And what does biodynamically grown mean? Biodynamic farming was developed in 1925 by an Austrian scientist named Rudolf Steiner. Rudolph's long gone by now, but um, he developed biodynamic farming, and biodynamic farming is a prescriptive, advanced form of organic farming. When I say prescriptive, we don't need to get into too deep into that because we have another 20 minutes on that, but the prescriptions of biodynamic farming are the two main tenets are Farming by lunar cycle, like they harvest by moon cycle, they prune by moon by lunar cycles, and then the second tenet is that they create these organic natural potions. Uh, they're they're mix up like one of them is is fine quartz powder with water, and they spray it on the vines. And each of these prescriptions. These compounds, they believe, have different prescriptive effects. They're all natural, made from 100% organic natural materials. They believe that they have impart a benefit to the vine. Okay. Now, do biodynamic wines taste better? Um, usually. I don't know if it's because of the biodynam- biodynamic farming, or it could be that anybody who is this obsessive and consumed with their farming practices are obsessive and consumed with everything. That makes sense. Right? And so they just make a better product. Yeah. Are there organic, not biodynamic wines that taste as good or better? Sure. I'm just yeah. saying when you taste biodynamic far- wines, they just seem to all taste great. Yeah. But I think, I don't know if there's any truth to, to, to biodynamic farming practices. Nobody knows. Nobody can claim to know that. Mm-hmm. But my feeling has always been anybody who puts that much excessive quality into something they're crafting is so neurotic about everything that, you know, they just probably make a better product. Yeah, that's a good assumption. Okay, that's, that's the first rule It's uh, for natural wine, organic or biodynamically grown. What are the other two? Number two, and this one is also a little bit confusing, but it's the, most, it's the second most important. And that is natural wines are always fermented with wild indigenous native yeast. That's a mouthful. Let me get back to that in a moment. Commercial wines are always fermented with GMO lab cultured yeast. Always? Always. Oh. And I'll tell you why. You can't make commercial wines using wild native yeast because the yeast is too unstable and you can't make the wine in very large volumes, which is why natural winemakers, natural wine growers, don't have any brand names. They can't make enough wine to create a brand. You can't make wine in large volumes using these native wild yeast. Hmm. Now, let's talk about those yeast. Well, how did they get there? They're collected in the in the air. They 
stick to the skin of the grape. They're blowing around the vineyard. And these yeast stick to the skin of the grape. When you harvest a grape berry anywhere in the world, it's got a white waxy film on the outside of it. You can scrape it with your fingernail. That's actually yeast. And that wild yeast has gathered on the, on, on the fruit in the vineyard, indigenous to where, where, where the fruit was grown. When it goes to conventional winemaking, they use sulfur dioxide to kill the native yeast before inoculating it with conventional lab-grown yeast. Hmm. So you're saying every commercial wine has GMOs in it? I'm saying it has, it has modified GMO yeast in it. I don't know if it has GMO in it or not. I'm saying okay. it's, they're using a modified yeast, and they modify the yeast to be stronger, sturdier, and to withstand a higher alcohol vo- mm, that um, makes sense. A, a, a higher alcohol level in the winemaking process. Alcohol levels have been rising in conventional wines for a few decades. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's a winemaking style. Alcohol adds density and heat to wine. Number two, alcohol, because of its dense and heat, heated nature, hides flaws in wine. And number three, the wine industry loves high alcohol because alcohol, I hate to report to you, drinkers like me, is addictive yeah. and is dangerous. Yeah. And it's toxic. So... That's not going to stop me from drinking wine, by the way, because I love drinking wine. It's going to help me to choose the type of wine I drink. And so uh, number three is that they're additive free. So there's no chance there's any dimethyl dicarbonate in a natural wine. And so that's they're also because they don't, the other redeeming factor both from a wellness point of view, as well as a taste point of view. One of the reasons they taste better, in addition to not having any sugar in them, not having high alcohol, but they've not been sterilized with sulfur dioxide. So conventional wines, commercial wines, get a high dose of sulfur dioxide at the time of bottling. This not only acts as a preservative, but it also sterilizes the wine. And what I mean by sterilization is that it kills every living bacteria in the wine. So wines naturally have bacteria, and they're full of bacteria. So it's like pasteurization of milk. Same deal. So every – Dr. David Perlmutter, who's a New York Times bestselling author on the micro gut biome, Mm -hmm. has written several times about natural wines and dry foam wines because we have – our certification has attributes above just being natural, but he's written about the, the living bacteria that still remain in natural wines because they haven't been sterilized. And there are three cited uh, bacteria that exist in natural wines that are supportive and friendly to the, to the micro gut biome. And you can research that. He's written about it several times. Yeah, I've had him on the show before too. He's great, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great guy. So the, these are the three attributes of a natural wine. Organic biodynamic farming, native yeast fermentation, and additive free. The result of that, while they're quite rare and difficult to find, we're the largest natural wine merchant in the world and the largest importer of natural wines in the world. Awesome. The reason they're hard to find is because they can't get into the retail system. Now, they, in fairness, in a few markets... They do. They're still hard to find, but in a few markets, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, Chicago a little bit, Dallas a tiny bit. I mean, tiny bit. Miami, tiny, tiny bit. I, I am Miami, yeah. Yeah. Are you in Miami? Yeah, Miami Beach. Oh, I live on Miami Beach. I just moved oh. there this winter. I didn't know that. Oh, cool. Well, we could talk about offline. We get some dinner. <laughs> oh, nice. No, I didn't know. Oh, I could I share mean, some favorite restaurants there. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, we'll, we'll I'm get, like we'll super stop. into, yeah, I live at uh, 33rd and Collins. Yeah, I'm in Bay Harbor Island. So 99th and like 10 minutes from me. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. That's so awesome. anyway, I moved there last year. Awesome. I didn't know Sunshine that. Sunshine <laughs> and taxes, you know. That's right. Yeah. Freedom I had to Florida. leave California. 
Yeah, but you're not you're not alone. You're the, you're the reason why our, my rent has gone up. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's crazy what's happened there. Crazy, absolutely crazy. So I, you know, even in a place like Miami, which is an urban and very sophisticated place, I'm telling you, there is very little natural wine there. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, microscopic amount, right? And. Uh, at the beach, there's one restaurant that sells natural wine. Um, Which is that? It's you called know? 27. It's at okay. the, have you ever been? No, no, I know of it, It's though. at the Freemark Hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, their whole wine is less natural. It's also a super funky kind of place where you would expect to find natural wine. Wow. There, there's I a mean, restaurant in, in Austin uh, called the Commodore that I think also has natural wine. We were just there with there, the Pompa. It, it's, it, it's out there. It's just super rare. Right, it's very. I rare. mean, yep. super rare. Um, and there's a finite amount. Of, it, it's less than one tenth of one percent of the worldwide wine production. I mean, it's like wow. there's there's so little of it out there in the first place. So, but anyway, that's you know. So I think about if you do drink, you should drink natural wine. And it, and now Dry Farm Wines has a certification that goes beyond natural wine. So, in our case, it has to be low alcohol, meaning twelve and a half percent by volume or less and we sell wines from seven to twelve and a half percent it has to be sugar free um meaning it's keto friendly for those who are excited about that keto <laughs> wine exactly healthy keto wine. <laughs> and diabetic friendly too i mean for the same reason yeah, yeah um, exactly and <clears throat> we also test for sulfites um and so and uh, the, the only way to know if wine has sugar in it is to lab test it. You can't always taste it. And in fairness, again, I don't want to claim to be the only sugar-free wine in the world because that's just not true. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is, again, there's no transparency. So you can have a conventional wine that's fully fermented and consequently sugar-free, right? And it's not natural. And it's very conventional, but it may be sugar-free. The problem is with the lack of transparency. So people say, oh, you know, lots of red wines are sugar-free. It's like, well, many are, yes. But the problem is you don't know which ones are which, which yeah. ones and which ones are not. And I'll also tell you that sugar is more prevalent in best-selling wines. So last year, we lab-tested the top 20 best-selling wines in America. And only two of them, just 10% of them, met our criteria for sugar-free. So for, now, for that one criteria, but if the, you were doing the certification on them, they wouldn't make me any of those criteria. They wouldn't they? meet any of our criteria that none yeah. of them would meet. None of the top 20 selling wines yeah. in the United States would meet our criteria by right. a long shot, not a yeah. single criteria. Right. They wouldn't be dry farmed. They wouldn't be low alcohol. They wouldn't be sugar free. And they certainly wouldn't be additive free. Mm -hmm. Right. They wouldn't meet any of our criteria. So that's the last one. Additive free is what you test for. Right. So, right. so that's, you know, that is, that I, I just think if people are going to drink or they should drink natural wine, if they're going to drink natural wine, they should try to find lower alcohol in natural wine because we've already talked about the toxicity of alcohol and it's certainly understandable why you don't drink. And my life might be better off if I didn't drink, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, I no, like you're drinking, right. right? It, you're right. It's, it's not it, it's you're being realistic. And the fact is people are going to drink. And as much as we, I want people not to drink and, and we see the benefit of people not drinking, if you're going to drink, making a smart, conscious choice that has been going through extensive testing, it's keto friendly, important for my audience. It's the right choice. So I, I was telling you offline, I always get asked the question, can I have alcohol on keto? And I say, maybe um, I personally don't drink, but if I were going to drink, it would be dry farm wine. So go check them out. And I'm always like, go check out dry farm wine. So this conversation was really overdue. And um, we have an affiliate set up for the keto campers listening and watching to get dry farm wines. And you have a subscription model. Uh, share a little bit more about when they go to the website. The website, by the way, is ketocampwine.com. It goes to my affiliate page with you guys. But share a little bit more about what they're going to see on there and how it works and how they could get your wine. Generally speaking, although not exclusively, you you can buy one-off wines from us. But generally speaking, we're a club membership. Uh, the wines are very affordable, considering it's a handcrafted 
wine product from Europe. We don't sell any domestic wines. Most of our wines are grown across Europe, small family farms. We have five growers in South Africa and a half dozen in South America. The rest are all scattered across Europe. Our wines, including shipping, which is a big deal because wine weighs a lot, are about 26 or $7 a bottle, all in, which is a great value for a natural, organic, handcrafted wine. So just because these wines are rare and vaulted, they're not that expensive as handcrafted products go. I realized that that can be a lot of money to some people and maybe they want to use it more occasionally or more on special occasions. But as this type of product goes, it's it's a solid value. So anyway, we sell wine typically by membership. The membership is free. And you can cancel it anytime you want, but it typically it's six or 12 bottles on any frequency of delivery that you want. Monthly, weekly, bi-monthly, quarterly, whatever you Daily you're, if you're taught. Was that? <laughs> I said daily if you're taught. Yeah, yeah, daily if you're made. Fortunately, I have an endless supply of rare yeah, of pure natural wines yeah. uh and so um and for many of our customers for regular wine drinkers who we're really situated for for regular wine drinkers their fear is not that they have too much wine their fear is that they'll run out right <laughs> and so our membership model works ideally for them and so and we have people that get a case a week right so it yeah. just depends on and then we have people who get six bottles once a quarter Right, yeah. so it, the propensity of our customers take a monthly or bi-monthly delivery. It's a great idea, and, and you know, I also love the idea if, if um, as a gift, if you know somebody who is drinking toxic wine or alcohol that is just not going to help them, and you want them to find a healthier option, you could gift them a membership and you know ship it out to them. It's a great gift, and also great for yourself. Uh, and the hangovers, right? It's it's going to be very uncommon to get those hangovers and the headaches and all the things that are associated with drinking other wines and other alcohol when you have something like this. So if you haven't tried it before, go to ketocampwine.com, camp is spelled with the K, and go check out how it works. You see also some great endorsements on there, including Dr. David Perlmutter and other uh, individuals who have uh, endorsed this. And my mentor, Dr. Pampa, is it's all he drinks and all his family drinks. And you're always at his I events. I assure you, he drinks stuff. about like me. He probably. No, him he drinks every day. Maryland. He drinks wine every day. Yeah, and, him and Marilyn are yeah. they're like winos for yeah, sure. They for love, sure. They, they love drink a lot stuff. of wine. Um, so, Todd, I want to thank you. Uh, we'll do a round two. I think we should do a round two around the holidays, too, because that will be a great time to... Uh, yeah, to I, we, we should also do... Um, since I've been on to talk about this, we do round two. We should really dive down into some other anti-aging, longevity hacks, fasting, um, practical applications of keto, eating keto in restaurants. Um, yeah, I'm down for all that. And we could do it in person here at my studio. Oh, yeah, because I'll be in Miami this winter. Yeah, I'm in California just... at the moment. I'm out here working. but Oh, you are? But okay, I yeah. Move... So... Yeah, I live in Miami usually between mid to late October and May and Smart. then, uh, and then the rest the of the time I'm traveling and, and working in California where I have some offices. That's so, a smart idea. That's when the weather is the nicest. So. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like great that. weather. And Oh dude, I, we have so much to talk. I'd love to do a session on, um, uh, on longevity and biohacking modalities that are natural and easy to do and free usually. You know, the if great it, thing about fasting is example. Not only is it free, it saves you money. Oh, it does. I, I, I did math on that and what it does. If you spend 15 bucks on breakfast every day, every weekday after a year, you save $3,900 right? and you get back to time as well. So you're right. If you're watching this on YouTube and you want to see round two of me and Todd talk about longevity and biohacking tips, comment down below. If you're listening on the podcast and you want to hear us do a round two, Leave a rating and review and say, hey, yeah, Todd, I love the episode. Do a round two with Ben. We want to hear about you all. So uh, ketocampwine.com. Where else can they find you social media? Yeah, we're Dry Farm Wines on all social. Super, super simple. Dry Farm Wines with an S all over social. We'll put it all, all down below for you. Um, Todd, thank you and your company and everybody on your team who's getting this, uh, getting the word out 
on this monopoly of the wine industry, but also giving people a healthy alternative that's keto friendly. So thank you. I enjoyed this conversation. I can't wait for round two. Thanks for having me.